If you're following along, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and go ahead and keep your finger there. We're going to look at uh, pretty much from verse 1 down to 10. We'll, we'll skip a couple of verses here and there. But what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes today, we're going to talk about questionable situations. I think there are a number of times we as Christians have dealt with uh, the issue at hand of whether or not we should go somewhere, whether or not we ought to be involved uh, in something. Maybe even that that we don't think anything's bad is going to take place or happen, but you know, there's always the possibility. And we can look at a number of situations that deal with this, but let's spend a little bit of time talking about questionable situations. But let's do that first by talking about those that we know are not questionable. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, It is reported commonly, so it's very open, everybody knows about it, it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. All right, Paul begins to address the congregation here in Corinth. Apparently everybody around has heard that there is a man here who is sleeping with his father's wife. And here's the thing, this certainly is a Christian, and he really ought to know better. This is not what we would be talking about as a questionable situation, right? This is open sin, and this open sin is going to require a consequence. So slide on down to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 4. Paul tells the congregation there regarding this Christian who's involved in this open sin, "...in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my Spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so what we have here are the Corinthians uh, as a congregation being told that they need to enforce church discipline on this man. Uh, he goes on and says, because they need to purge out the leaven amongst the congregation. There in verses 6 and verse 7. But here's the interesting thing. It's not just the church that had sin going on. As a matter of fact, we learned that it was also found amongst those who were non-Christians there in the city of Corinth. And we know that the same thing is true for today. We've certainly heard of situations within the church where people were involved in sin. And we definitely know without a doubt that there are people around us, non-Christians, who are involved in sin. Now move over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He then says, and we'll notice a distinction here, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Now we could spend quite a bit of time on this verse, but what Paul is doing here is, is he is showing there is a distinction. We have already seen that there are Christians involved in sin, and now we realize that the world is also involved in sin. And the thing is, is one should already know that these things are wrong, and the other group needs to know about it. Now, even though we as Christians do find ourselves living in this world, we are surrounded by people who are not Christians, uh, oftentimes friends, co-workers, maybe even family members that are living in sin. We may even be surrounded by some of our own brothers and sisters in Christ who are wayward. They're simply, to, simply put, they're not being faithful. Because we live in this world, we are oftentimes faced with opportunities to participate in things or to go places or to spend time with people that we really ought not to. And so, in all of these situations, we have to start making some decisions. Should I go? Should I be involved with that? Should I spend time with that person? Now, let's make it easy. There are a number of times when there are situations uh, that we know are, are just plain wrong. We know that there are people who are constantly involved in sin that we really ought not to be spending time with. And we also understand that when it comes to things like this, we are to avoid those outright sinful places and those outright sinful people. Uh, we know logically that it just doesn't make any sense to involve ourselves uh, in those places or with those people. But what about when there are opportunities uh, placed in front of us that are questionable and we're trying to determine whether or not we could be involved uh, in the activity or spend time 
with that person? Well, in many of these regards, what we have to do is begin to ask ourselves, have I really thought this through? Have I really considered what could take place? Have I really considered a number of things? And so we're going to start to talk a little bit about that. This won't be a real long lesson. But let's talk for just a few minutes about some questionable situations. Certainly there are a number of situations that will take place in our lives that we, are, we know without a doubt are obviously wrong. However, there are some Christians who have this idea that they can, they can be involved in these things or go to these places, and yet, you know, if I don't really participate in them, then I'm not per se really guilty. They think they can be around whatever these activities are or even uh, who these people are, and it'll be fine as long as they're not actually doing them. Well, one of the first things I'd want to recommend that we go back and consider is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 22, which says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. I mean, the first thing we want to do as followers of God is, is let other people know that we live a pure life. I don't really think you can get a whole lot more basic than that for a follower of God. And really, in every situation that we deal with, and I know many people have struggled with with this, we need to be asking ourselves, have I really thought this through? I think this is probably one of the true uh, first tests for somebody who's either a new Christian or for somebody who is a, uh, um, a Christian who's been struggling in you know, their complete understanding of the Scriptures. There are a number of things that you may not have complete understanding of. And so in all of these situations, you need to go back and begin to ask yourself, is this something that a Christian is authorized to participate in? Is this something that would be beneficial to me to go and to be involved in? Certainly, I think the stark reality is, is that many of us know Christians who, who uh, are open about the fact that they are a Christian, and yet we also see that many of them are uh, involved in many activities. We'll see it posted on social media and you wonder to yourself, what were they thinking? The majority of the people, I guess, that they know or that they work with know that they're Christians, and yet I have to admit some of the, some of the most horrible things I've seen posted on social media were done by those who are Christians. Well, I want us to notice an interesting verse as we, as we talk about questionable things. And again, let's remember this. There are oftentimes things that will happen or take place, and, and we had no idea it would take place. Uh, we never even thought about it as we went somewhere or to be involved in an activity or as we went to somebody's house. But I want to notice an interesting verse. I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 5, and here we have Jesus. He makes a statement, and he points something out, and I think many overlook this. Matthew 5, verse 27, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now it's interesting, Jesus begins to talk about adultery, and then he begins to address people's eyes in lusting. Now there's a big difference between adultery and having lust. But here's the thing, and I think many people don't realize it, uh, it's not like adultery just happens, where someone goes out and just all of a sudden they get involved in adultery. We know certainly that it does start with the eyes and the, the heart or the Bible mind. And if this isn't stopped really quick, I, I'm talking about the actual uh, lusting itself, it could progress on to something. Let's just use the example of maybe of somebody who, who uh, is spending time with a coworker. Uh, they find that person attractive or they find them appealing. And before you know it, you're, you begin to have personal, intimate conversations with a person who's not your spouse. You really got to ask yourself in this situation, have I really thought this through? Because if you don't, before you know it, you're spending time having lunch with them. Before you know it, you're spending time in their office having long conversations, or you're emailing them, or you're texting them back and forth. And again, you have to ask yourself, have I thought this through? I think the majority of us have known people who have fallen into situations like this, something that innocently started off uh, innocent and yet progressed into something which certainly was not. Many of us know of emotional affairs that have taken place. 
We know of even physical affairs that have taken place. And I think oftentimes it all started because in their mind they hadn't really done anything wrong yet. And then one step leads to another step. And before you know it, they've walked much farther than they ever thought that they would. And I think in their minds, in a situation like this, many may be saying something like, you know, it's, it's just lunch with a coworker, or I'm just helping this person get through a difficult time. And guys, I've even heard where this has taken place, where somebody initially was supposedly trying to teach somebody the gospel. And then before you know it, they've spent so much time with this person and it leads to an affair. Jesus starts off talking about adultery and then he begins to condemn lust. And we could look at a number of other activities and there are certainly many other activities that are just as bad. And just because some particular activities are not called out as inherently sinful doesn't mean that it would be a good idea for us to participate in those activities. Again, we have to ask ourselves in all situations, have I really thought this through? What is it that this situation could lead to? I'm going to go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 through 18, as we, as we look and get an understanding about the Christian's mindset. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, Paul tells the, the congregation there, the church in Corinth, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." The idea there really is, is we as Christians ought to be striving for purity at all times. Our eyes should be wide open to the dangers of sin around us. It could happen at any time. I think many of us have the understanding that there are many different worldly activities which involve, to some extent, sin. Now I'm going to go over to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5. And I will say this as we're talking about these questionable circumstances. Many of us probably have uh, members of our family who are either not Christians or are wayward, unfaithful Christians. And we struggle with the mindset of, should I be involved in, you know, in family get-together? Should I be involved in things that they're participating in. And the reason we have to often ask that question is, is because we know many of the things that our family members do uh, are not acceptable. And we have to ask ourselves again, what kind of reputation am I going to have? Listen to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now you may be asking yourself, well, I don't do those things. And what really is the danger of being in in these places where this is present or where people are indulging in these types of behaviors if I myself am not indulging in them. Let me just throw an example out there. It, it would be if you were going to go to a family member's house, uh, let's say there's a family reunion, and you know for a fact that, that they oftentimes drink, uh, and so there's probably going to be alcohol involved in that, and you know this ahead of time. You need to ask yourself, what's the danger of you being there when you're not going to be involved in that? Listen to Proverbs 6, 27 and 28. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Basically what the Proverbs writer here is saying is if you play with fire, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get burned. And when you begin to go to these places, even though you're not doing it, and you begin to spend time around people like like this, you are playing with fire. And again, what about your reputation? Listen to Proverbs 22.1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. There's not a whole lot you can do immediately to repair a destroyed reputation. Ask yourself, what will being there at these types of events or hanging out with people involved in this type of sin, what's it going to do to your reputation? 
And you may not be able to avoid many of these things that take place in your life. Oftentimes, some of these things will happen when you're there. You don't know what's going to happen. And really, all you can do at that point is to separate yourself from that taking place as quick as you can. But there are other times when you do know that these types of things will happen. Uh, you already know in advance that it may be a questionable situation. And when you know that, you ought not to be spending time there, and you shouldn't really even contemplate on whether or not you ought to be there. And you, again, you may say, well, what's the harm? One of the things we need to understand is many of the people around us, they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. I want you to go on over to Romans 1, verse 21. Romans 1, verse 21. And I think that as I consider many of the people I know in my life, uh, I wouldn't call them friends, but maybe acquaintances, I think this does a good job describing quite a few of them. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. It's interesting that when I talk to people, many people even claim to know that there is a God, or they see the evidence that there is a God, or there is a Creator, and yet many do not give Him the glory, and they continue to do those things which we know clearly are wrong and are sinful. Romans 1.28, we find this, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I think the point we have being made here is, as many people don't want to think about God or the fact that God has a standard of morality, that He has requirements for mankind, and they don't want to think about that because they want to continue to indulge in sin. And God's going to allow them to continue to do that through their own free will but there will be a consequence. Living in and constantly being around sinful situations seems to, at least to me, to make people forget about God, or at least they don't want to really focus on God or spiritual things. Uh, and let's, let's get this straight as we begin to talk about people who slowly drift away or, or become unfaithful. It's not like forgetting God or deciding to not follow the standard of God is something that just happens overnight. I think many of us know people who are no longer faithful. We often see that it starts really as a very slow process. Oftentimes it increases uh, over time as their involvement from the church begins to wander and their time that they spend around those of the world begins to increase. Uh, it's not usually that the seat in the church building is immediately empty. What we find is, is they come less and less and they're involved in you know, the assemblings of the body less and less, until eventually what we realize is, is we haven't seen them in a month, or we haven't seen them in a year. I'm thinking about a specific individual. I think he hasn't probably been here for about a year and a half. I know that he is a Christian. I know that he, uh, he sees what we post on social media, and I actually see his postings on social media. And I often wonder to myself, does he even realize that he has slowly drifted away to become part of the world. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5. through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's an important phrase to, to remember. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You ever known people that appeared to be godly, and yet they denied the power of the actual faith? I think many of us have known people like that. When we as Christians begin to associate with sin, we run the risk of becoming the type of person that actually loves the pleasures of this life and this world more than we do God. Now here's an interesting point. God actually has given some people up. Again, I'm going to go over to Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 26. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, 
who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. You may participate in these things and you think to yourself, I haven't given up on God. And yet we really ought to be asking ourselves a couple of things. One, have I thought this through? And two, has the thought even ever crossed my mind that maybe God's given up on me because I have slipped into sin? I've become more like the world than I, I am uh, like the faithful Christians that I used to surround myself around. I'm going to go over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. And I think if we would remember this passage, it would help us oftentimes as we look at many of the situations that we deal with in this life. And we have to ask ourselves, have I really thought this through? And again, you'll notice I've, I've not been very specific on a number of things. And the reason is, is because uh, these questionable situations, they come in so many forms, in so many places, involving so many things that we really can't just list example after example. But in all situations, we should think about what we find here in James 4, 7 through 10. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh, or draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Now we could go back and look at a number of examples uh, of places or things that are sinful and things that we ought not to participate in. Um, but in most regards, we ought to ask ourselves, why should I even be at a place like this where these things may happen or we know are going to happen? And it might be that your very presence there violates a number of these principles that we've looked at. And I know this wasn't a very long lesson, and I know we didn't give great examples for these questionable things, but I do know that I myself have had to ask myself before I went somewhere or before I spent time with somebody, is it possible that something may happen that would either cause me to sin or might cause me to be tempted to sin, and what would it do to my reputation? Those are things that we need to talk about and we need to think about a little more often than probably we do. Now, as I draw this to a close, I won't spend much time on it, but certainly we are concerned for everyone. Uh, we want all people to be faithful Christians. And if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, it's not a very complicated process. I'll simply go back to the Bible examples that we have. There were people teaching the gospel. They were teaching who Jesus was, that He was the Messiah, that He came and He was going to establish a church, His church, and He would shed His blood for the remission of sins. It's necessary that you believe that. If you do not, you're going to die in your sins, John 8, 24. You need to repent of the sins in your life. Jesus makes that clear in Luke 13, 3 and 5. Paul also talks about it at Mars Hill there in Acts 17, 30. You need to confess Christ with your mouth, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and just like we see the Ethiopian eunuch doing there in Acts chapter 8. And you need to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, you have not yet been added to the church. The Lord adds you to the church when you've obeyed His commands, Acts 2, verse 47. Certainly, if you are watching this for the first time and you've never heard that, I went through that very quickly. I would not mind spending some time with you uh, online or uh, via phone discussing and, and actually going through all of the verses in great detail. You can either contact us via email or you can call us and leave a message. But if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, what I mean is, is you've not been added to the Lord's church. There's no way you can end up in heaven. I don't know a clearer way to say that. But at the same time, let's also state that for those who are Christians, your goal should be to be pure, to not be involved or find yourself in these questionable situations where you may either be tempted to sin or you actually find yourself involved in sin. If you have been, I would encourage you to repent of those things that you've been involved in. I would encourage you to again be faithful. I'll go look up uh, 1 John 1 verses 7 through 9 and again strive to be pure in all actions, all thoughts. If there's a way that we can help you in any way, you can simply contact us here at the, at the church.